Welcome to Go For Gold, Shaw TV's celebration of the spirit of the Games. And nowhere is this stronger than at the Paralympics. And our first story features Canada's own Bob Stedward, the founder of the Paralympics. Now retired at 68 and fully enjoying his time as a grandfather and horseman, Dr. Bob Stedward, an officer of the Order of Canada, is the man who spearheaded the international Paralympic movement in the late 1980s. I really measure sort of the modern Paralympic era in 1988 when uh, in Seoul, because that's when we really moved to a sport model. That's when our coaches started uh, getting better training. They were paying coaches for what they did. Uh, we were getting better competitions around the world, etc. That organization brought several disability groups under one banner, as if Stedward wasn't already a busy man. I had my sport medicine clinic with Randy Gregg. I was full-time at the university. I had a full-time teaching and research load. So uh, it was full-time, but it just meant you worked 90 hours a week. And, uh, you know, I was traveling uh, 400,000 miles a year in an airplane and uh, living out of a suitcase. Fortunately, he enjoyed some flexibility in his many roles. One of the biggest challenges I've ever had in my life. So the first thing I did is I put together a proposal, you know, a structure and governance that I thought might work. Bob Stedward is still a member of the International Olympic Committee and life member, always attends Olympics and Paralympics, and though retired recently, attended a future Olympics meeting in Greece. But often today, Bob Stedward prefers a quieter lifestyle. It's a quarter horse, and uh, his name is Buck. When I retired, uh, you know, I. Got, uh, got one of my horses and uh, started uh, roping, take my horse up to the mountains and go riding up there. It's a magnificent place to go to up in the Yaha Tinda, uh, roping or riding with your friends. And, and then I just come out uh, to uh, Ed Wedman's ranch here uh, three or four times a week and just ride and down into the river valley and uh, have a little bit of peace of mind. Yes, a rodeo guy from an agricultural community of Eston, Saskatchewan would become an author, sports scientist, talent manager, consultant, significant volunteer, and founding president of the International Paralympic Committee, creator of a major world sport body. Within 12 years, there was over 175 nations during my uh, 12 years of presidency. So it, it not only grew in size and numbers, but the quality of the competition is, uh, it, it just challenges uh, anything that we think is humanly possible now. Dr. Stedward is also in the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Award and the Alberta Order of Excellence. One decorated Edmontonian. For Go For Gold in Edmonton, I'm Tim Dancy. Standing to wax his snowboard, Tyler Mosher has overcome the unimaginable. I was never supposed to walk again. On December 30th, 2000, Mosher broke his back while snowboarding after falling 10 meters and landing on the top of his head. My back exploded at one vertebrae, totally exploded like a grenade going off in your body. It ended up being an incomplete injury and uh, you know I got back the muscles that enabled me to walk although I'm still medically 40% paralyzed below the waist. Preparing his board to head up on the mountain for training, this world champion adaptive snowboarder will represent Canada during the 2014 Paralympics, the first time the adaptive sport will be included in the Games. I was in the legislature with Rick Hansen uh, May 2nd, 2012, when the announcement came out and I was elated uh, that snowboarding got named to the 2014 program um, and in many ways I won my gold medal on that day. Stacking his bones as though he's walking on stilts, Mosher heads down the 100 steps from his house. Just getting to the mountain is a feat in itself but one that he's proud to say he's able to do. It's a tough go because realistically everyone's telling you that you're gonna to need to be in a wheelchair. And um, it's, it's upsetting, but you don't, you don't dwell on what you don't have. You get through by looking at what you do have. This won't be his first Paralympic Games. Mosher's cross-country rehabilitation led him to compete for Canada on home turf in 2010. The goal then was not to win a medal, but gain experience as a Paralympic athlete that would help him put snowboarding in the forefront of adaptive sports. I was constantly pursuing uh, the development of racing for the disabled, 
in snowboarding so that it would be funded at the grassroots level so that children living with a disability who wanted to snowboard with their friends would have the opportunity to snowboard. 13 years after his accident, Mosher is going for the real gold. Constantly working on his technique, snowboarding isn't as easy as it once was. He must be focused, completely in tune with his mind, body and board, telling his muscles exactly what to do. He must train hard so that when race day comes, Mosher can simply look through his lens and go as fast as he can. I'm going there as a frontiers person and a pioneer for adaptive snowboarding. I'm going there to represent my country, but I'm not going there as a tourist. I'm going there to win. From Whistler, I'm Heather Butts for Shaw TV. Hitting the ice on a pair of blades is what hockey's all about for this 13-year-old. The fact that I have a sport that I can play, even though um, I can't play stand-up hockey, but I can still play a, an adapted hockey. In sledge hockey, players sit on specially designed sleds or sledges with skate blades under the seat. Spencer Lambert was born with spina bifida and started playing in 2008 after learning about the program from the Society for Manitobans with Disabilities. Individuals with disabilities and individuals without disabilities can participate in sledge hockey. It's a matter of allowing them to um, develop their self-esteem, their self-confidence, um, to show them that they can achieve whatever they set their mind to. Sledge hockey didn't come to Spencer right away. It took some time to figure it out. The turning was a hard thing to learn. You lean and you want to put your glove on the ice and then still keep going with your other arm. Spencer's hard work and love of sports caught the attention of Shriners Hospital Montreal and the Air Canada Foundation. The charity organizations invited Spencer to attend the first week of the Paralympics in Sochi, Russia as a VIP. His father Richard is going with Spencer and can't wait to share the experience. Richard couldn't be more proud to show his support for the athletes. They're just doing what they want to do. They, they have the opportunity to do it, now they can do it. So it, it looks like sometimes uh, it's hard for us to understand, like, how can they do that? But it's because that's what they know to do, and that's what they're going to do. And for Spencer, sledge hockey is just the tip of the iceberg. I play wheelchair rugby, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis. He's always up for a challenge, and he's tried a lot. If he can get there or somebody provide him, help him get there or whatever, he'll, he'll give it a try, and he enjoys most of them. It's easy to see Spencer loves sledge hockey and hope one day I can play in it in the Olympics. For Go Winnipeg, I'm Blair Malstravich. In the last couple of years, it's been a roller coaster for sure, because you know I came off 2010 and it was like the peak of my career and it dropped off quick, right? I didn't really have a contingent plan for what to do after the games. Since capturing silver at the Vancouver 2010 Paralympic Games, Kimberly, B.C. native Josh Duick has had a journey filled with ups and downs. Allowing my intuition to guide me and not let fear define me. He was invited to speak at a TEDx event, was the main subject of a mini documentary, became the first person to perform a backflip on a sit ski, and even appeared on Ellen. But despite these highlights, Duick also experienced what he calls a Paralympic hangover. Physically, I, I lost my spark on the hill and I lost my, my ability to be the skier that I'd become. And that was difficult. The sport of slalom skiing is in constant evolution, which meant Duick needed to adapt to different equipment. Everything from new bindings to adjusted suspension and different aerodynamics. The transition for Duick was anything but smooth. I didn't trust my equipment anymore, so when you don't trust your equipment, how can you really commit to going 140 kilometers an hour down the hill? He started to become disillusioned with the sport, and the negativity even began to seep into his personal life. So given this post-Olympic depression was carrying on for over a year, and I saw that it was consuming every part of me. Right? Like it was, it was 
changing the way that I viewed my sport. It was changing my ability to ski. It, uh, it was affecting my personal life. You know, I almost pushed my wife right out of my life and that was, you know, worst case scenario, that's the last thing that I want to happen. But I, I changed as a person because of that. You know, I, I was lost and I was scared and it was dark. Duick had hit rock bottom and was strongly considering leaving the sport. But then the phone rang. It was a producer from Solomon Free Ski TV. And we did a little, you know, it was supposed to be like a two or three minute webisode and just catch a couple little shots of me learning to ski pow in the backcountry. But it turned out that it worked really well. You know, my sit ski in that environment was perfect. And we ended up getting so many shots and building a story that was worthy of creating a little mini documentary that we called The Freedom Chair. And that was a huge turning point for me. That, that changed everything, is you know, moving outside of that competitive realm for a little bit, back into the creative world for a while, so that I could have a little more of a, an open or a global perspective on the sport as a whole. And now, with the Sochi Games just around the corner, Duick's motivation is back. I really dedicated myself to learning more about the equipment, so applying my energy towards the evolution of the sit ski and the ski that I ride on, trying to find that perfect harmony. In 2010, Duick captured silver in his home country, running on pure, fearless adrenaline. Now, four years later, Duick heads to Sochi with experience, composure, and added perspective. My goal is to simply um, position myself to where I'm skiing well again, and and have a playful and curious approach to the mountain. So if I can do that, if I can have a really comfortable and playful approach to how I make my ski turn when I come down the hill, then I suspect I'll be you know, no longer vying for that top 20 like I was last season. I'll be right back in the, the mix for the top spot. So it's exciting. From Vernon, British Columbia, for Go For Gold, I'm Kevin Chirac. We hope you're enjoying our coverage of Canada's Paralympians. Their stories are inspiring even outside of international competition. When we come back, we'll meet a Paralympian who is giving back to her community, a young skier who is already a winner, an unlikely snowboard cross athlete, and more coming up on Go For Gold. You don't have to feel like you're being held back because I have a prosthetic leg. You do what you can do with it. Now, could you try the ramp, please? Brayden lost his leg at age five. He contracted a flesh-eating disease that took his left leg, but not his spirit. I feel you're you're dealt with that card. You can't necessarily change it, but you can you really can change the way you feel about it and the way you the way you go about things. We decided uh, very early on that we were not going to impose any sort of limitations on Braden's ability because he was very strong and able. He proved that um, long before he even got an artificial leg. And we decided to have the support of his three siblings that we would all do something new together. None of them had ever skied. And so the family started skiing. Braden quickly developed a love for the sport, but learning to ski was never an easy process for him. When Braden first started skiing, he needed something protective so that when he fell, which was inevitable, he was pushing the envelope, um, that he wasn't going to injure himself. We actually first started with a heated inner sock that we had made from uh, hunting socks with battery packs. Raiden's second attempt? Way up top. It's definitely a struggle from the start. There's, I don't. You know, I don't remember the exact details of it, but, you know, a little frustrating, you know, falling down, getting back up, falling down, getting back up. Then it wasn't easy on mom or dad. Dad is always lugging him up the hill because he couldn't get back up to fall down again. But he proved to be a really, really persistent young man. And his persistence has paid off throughout the years. The 20-year-old athlete competed on the BC team for six years before moving up to the national team in 2011. Now he's preparing to compete in the 2014 Sochi Paralympic Winter Games. 
this will be my first Paralympics. The hype's getting up already and nervous already, but it's very exciting. It's a celebration. We celebrated the fact that he made it through a life-threatening illness, only missing a limb, but he had a life. And we celebrated that to the fullest for a lot of years. And now to celebrate that he's preparing for Sochi. Um, to win a medal would be awesome for Canada, but it's just a great celebration that he's even going. This March, Braden will be traveling to Russia to compete in the Paralympic Games, and he hopes this is one of many Winter Games he'll be part of. I feel if you have a positive attitude, you really can do whatever you believe you can do. In Nanaimo, I'm Rayanne the Plant. It was nearly four years ago when Canada's wheelchair curling team captured gold on home ice. Armstrong BC's Ina Forrest remembers that golden moment like it was yesterday. Almost like your heart's going to burst into tears because when you see that flag going up, I don't think there's a bigger highlight for anybody. On the surface, the team appears, well, random. It features men and women of various ages stemming from different communities all over Canada. And though each of their individual stories are unique, they all share that common theme of persevering through utmost adversity. No, is okay, but... Case in point, team lead Sonia Gaudet, who became paralyzed from the chest down after a tragic horseback riding accident 17 years ago sort of gives you a new perspective on, you know, a life that first you feel like, well, what's that going to be like in a wheelchair all of a sudden? So um, it opened up some, a lot of doors for me, for sure. It was just like giving me a second life. Team skip Jim Armstrong was once a high-level, able-bodied curler, but multiple sports injuries and car accidents forced him to retire in 2004. Desperately missing his favorite pastime, a few years later, he tried out wheelchair curling took me from a place where curling was so much a part of my life, where I'd lost it completely, and I regained it. And uh, I've just loved every minute of it since. Thirteen and a half. Ina Forrest was an avid volleyball player in her youth, but at just 21 years old, en route to a tournament in Prince George, she was struck by an impaired driver, leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. Starting back into competitive sports just made you realize there was such a void in your life. It was something I'd always enjoyed when I was young, and the competitive spirit was still there. So once I got started, I, I knew I really missed it. Sanford, Manitoba's Dennis Thiessen is new to the squad and will be experiencing his first Paralympics at Sochi 2014. For the past two years, they have been just fantastic, and, and, and I think it's also with the people who you're with. I have a, a, a fantastic team to be around. and and curl with and uh, I mean we enjoy each other's company on and off the ice so that, that makes a big difference. The team is coming off a gold medal at the 2013 World Championships and are the heavy favorite heading into the 2014 Sochi Paralympic Games. Though the team has no shortage of skill and experience, <laughs> one big reason for their success is simply they like each other. When there's something to uh, work through, we work through it. We don't let it brew. And I think the sport of curling, you know, just the etiquette and the, around the sport of curling, um, we really take that to the next level and we, we keep it as positive as possible all the time. Everybody's supportive, so it just comes back to being a lot of fun and a relaxed atmosphere out there. And I think that's how we play as well as we do because we just are happy enjoying the game together. The whole wheelchair sport, it's a, it's a unique club and uh, everybody has their own story and uh, you're a part of it. Uh, and it's, it's a very exclusive club. And once, you're, once you become part of that club, it's a very exclusive friendship you get. Cheer us on and, uh, and uh, watch us bring home the gold. From Vernon, British Columbia, for Go For Gold, I'm Kevin Chirac. All I gotta do is get to the bottom first. And that's just what Ian Lockie is aiming to do in Sochi this March, where he will be representing Canada in the Paralympic Games. It's been a long journey for the snowboard cross-athlete. After a snowboarding accident in 1998, 
resulting in compressed vertebrae and a spinal cord injury, left Lockie 50 percent paralyzed from the waist down. So after my surgery, they put me in a back brace and they took me into the surgeon's office and the surgeon said, you'll never walk again which I was a little bit like, well, I don't like walking places anyway. And then Ian tagged onto the end of that, no snowboarding, no surfing, no skateboarding, no bike riding. And I was like, no, that's not correct. I, I, my friends are pretty good. They'll duct tape my wheelchair to a surfboard if they have to. Armed with determination and strong support from family and friends, Ian began his journey to recovery putting countless hours into physio and rehabbing at the gym before attempting to make a comeback at his various sports. First of all, obviously, I tried biking because riding a bike is pretty easy. And then I tried surfing. That was something I wasn't able to, I'm not able to do anymore. I put a skateboard on the ground and stood on it and went, no, that's not going to work. And then that was, it was in 1998 that I had my accident. And in 2001, I decided I would try snowboarding again. And my first day on the mountain, discovered very quickly it was still a possibility. It was 2002 when Ian first came to Red Mountain and after a few years of training in the Kootenays he was able to compete in his first ever contest in a para division with para alpine skiing at the Canadian Nationals in the snowboard division. I first started competing in 2005 and then discovered that the USA, US Snowboarding Association had an adaptive class so I went to the 2007 US Nationals in California and did very well there, won all the events and then have been, we've been trying to push towards the Paralympics since then and we thought we were going to get a, a look in in 2010 but that didn't happen and then they kind of said we, we kind of gave up hope and then in May in 2012 they announced that snowboarding would be included in the 2014 Paralympics. So it's been all systems go since then. We've been having many World Cups the world over and there are now about 15 nations that have athletes competing. And while rehabilitation is still ongoing for the Paralympian, he has learned firsthand what determination and positivity can do. One of the big things I've been through, and my one of my one of my personal trainers said, you know, they were like, do this exercise. And I was like, I can't do that. And he came over to me and he said, I've seen you ride your bike, I've seen you snowboard. Not I can't, how can I? You know, that's what you have to adapt. Not I can't, how can I make that work for me? It's all about refining what I have, just making the things I have go better. Lockie heads to Spain to participate in the Snowboard Cross World Cup Finals before leaving for Sochi on March 5th and is grateful for the opportunity to represent Canada at the Paralympics on behalf of his supporters and his country. Yeah, I'd really like to thank everyone who's helped me over the years, to all my local sponsors and friends and to Red Mountain and to the white stuff that falls out of the sky. Thank you very much. And to my friend Gravity, without you I'd be lost. For Go For Gold in Rosalind, I'm Christina Kurchkowski. Passion and persistence have brought Paulette Begonia back to the trail to train for the 2014 Paralympics. After doing wheelchair racing in 91, I also discovered cross-country skiing from a former athlete, Joe Harrison, and uh, Pat Prokopczyk and Jeff Whiting said, we have a sit ski, do you want to try it? And I tried it and I was like, yes, this completes me kind of feeling normal as an athlete and having that opportunity to ski in winter. Begonia's career has spanned decades. She is one of only a few athletes to win multiple medals in the Paralympic Summer and Winter Games. My first Paralympics was in 92, and since then it's been more the gold to medal. Today, with nine Olympics behind her, Begonia is a mentor for budding athletes. It was a huge shock when I first met Colette. I had no idea that there was a Paralympic athlete right in my hometown. In her teens, Bergonia was a promising cross-country runner competing at a national level. But in 1980, a car accident left her paralyzed. It was her university professors that encouraged her to continue on in sports. They also found some sports that I could be active in as far as wheelchair racing. And I found a, a former wheelchair athlete that competed in Seoul, had mentioned to me that I could go to the Paralympics and that began a journey of wheelchair racing and cross-country skiing and a relationship with SAS Sport that has been phenomenal. Brittany was born without part of her left arm. 
She says a chance meeting with Colette changed her life. The thing as a developing athlete is you don't always know what questions to ask and Colette's very aware of that so any information that I need she just hands it my way and it's been really great working with her and she's such a motivating person. At 51 years old, she's training for what she says is her final Paralympics in Sochi, Russia. Definitely be awesome if we can go together, if we are, you know, if I'm healthy and Brittany makes it to the team, that's just going to be an experience that'll be awesome. And we'll make it a good time and uh, do our best for Canada. Colette will compete in the sport of cross-country sit skiing. She trail trains alongside her 20-year-old protege. I hope that I can make it to Sochi. I think that would be a really good experience for my first Paralympics. And then hopefully in the next four years, I could even do better at the Paralympics after that in Korea. Bergogna will spend the final months before the Olympic Games training in Canmore, Alberta. She says there's a huge sense of accomplishment and pride with winning a medal. Hudak hopes to one day experience that feeling for herself. For Shaw, I'm Lisa Rizum.